yesterday, Sarah saw her salvo and liberation launched a bombshell on the, the Union. Uh, it's attracted enormous interest. And basically, we thought it'd be a good idea to have this programme to allow people to hear a bit more about it and get a better understanding of exactly how this theft has been uh, committed. So in the first instance, I'm going to invite one of my guests, Sarah Sawyers, the author of the paper, to explain what this is all about. Sarah. Thanks, Ian. And, uh, and thanks for having me. Um, well, most people who are interested in independence will have watched the submission to the Supreme Court by Dorothy Bain, the Lord Advocate of Scotland on behalf of the Scottish Government. Um, which if you'd been, if you hadn't known what was going on, you might have thought she was actually um, speaking for the other side <laughs> because <coughs> she, uh, very, she very uh, emphatically made a number of statements that really put Scotland in its place. You know, she, uh, she said, I, th I think three times, I, I might, it might only have been twice, but I think three times, and once in writing, she stated that Scotland stopped being a, a, a kingdom um, at the time of the Treaty of Union. Um, and, and so did England. I'm sure that uh, English patriots loved that as well, because they were replaced by a united kingdom of Great Britain. And that single homogenous entity is what we live in. So what she was, what she was really trying to establish is that uh, no matter what we call ourselves, we are a territory, a territorial part, a component part of a, of a larger nation. And, you know, that, that kind of got, you know, that's been eclipsed by the fact that, I'm not, I'm not sure how many people paid attention to that, but it's been eclipsed, of course, by the ruling by the Supreme Court on Wednesday that uh, we're not a colony, we're in a voluntary union, but we don't have, we're subject to Westminster parliamentary sovereignty. And so what the court might not have realized it was saying, um, you know, in, in international terms was you're a voluntary colony. That's what we got told. But you know, the thing is that what the, the court of a, an oppressive and colonial administration says is legal is not necessarily legal in international law. And what we've discovered is that the union co as constituted in law is not the union that they keep telling us we're in. That picture of this um, abolished Scotland and abolished England and one kingdom and um, you know that we're really a territory in, in a single country, it's not legally true. Um, it's an example of the kind of lie that we've been told for 300 years, but it's a very important lie for them. And the reason it's such an important lie is that we're not actually in a single union. We joined in a political and economic union. And you notice they're quite careful to talk about the voluntary political union. And they don't say anything about the territorial union. And that's because there was never a territorial union. And this all, you know, again, like the claim of right, it might sound like ancient history, but it's actually incredibly important. And as you'll see, it means that Scotland has been subject to criminal fraud by the British state for, well, certainly, you know, for, for the last century, but, but, you know, going right back. The sovereignty that we've been talking about for, you know, so loudly this year, didn't come from the claim of right. The claim of right was a, a, an act that emphasized and enacted the sovereignty of the Scottish people. Where the sovereignty comes from is something called, uh, well, it's the crown, the institution of the crown. So, you know, this is as difficult as it was explaining the claim of right to people eight months ago, but hopefully within a very short period of time this will be easy for everybody they'll all be familiar with it we're all used to thinking of the crown as being and what the english version of the crown the english version of the crown is you've got the king at the top and everybody else underneath in a sliding scale of importance 
the the ruler, the person in whom authority is 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 based, the power, and that can get you know taken over by Parliament as it did in England. But that's what that means. What people don't know is that it did it never meant that in Scotland. Um, you know, we, we know from the Declaration of Our Broth that the, the, the king, Bruce, could be replaced if he didn't keep his end of the bargain. So the, pe the people who replaced him were obviously had a higher authority than him. But what most people don't realise is that what the crown means in Scotland isn't a king or a queen. The crown is the community of the realm. Now, when they talk about the right of the crown, crown interests, crown property. You immediately think of, you know, in the past, Queen Elizabeth and today it'll be King Charles. That's not true in Scotland. It never was. The crown is the community of the realm. The monarch represents that community of the realm. And what that means is that the land, the resources, the assets of Scotland could never go into a union because it belonged to the people. It could never been taken, have been taken into a union by Queen Anne, who didn't, didn't own it. It was, the, it was the people. She couldn't bring that into the union. Just as the sovereignty of the people couldn't go into Westminster, a Westminster parliament, because the parliament didn't have it. The sovereignty belonged to the people. You can't sell something you don't own. You can't sell your neighbor's house. You can't make a deal on behalf of the guy I next door. There, yeah? yeah, I think we'll bring you back in shortly. Yeah. Uh, Sarah, I think I would like to go to Alf at this point because Alf has been explaining to us all for many months, Alf will probably say years, uh, of what the impact of being a colony is and how it's based around plunder. And I don't think we'll ever come across a better example of plunder than what you've uncovered. What have you got to say, Alf, about this? <clears throat> well, I think Sarah's right, but <clears throat> as, a, as a student of post-colonial theory, uh, what I can say is, is exactly what Sarah's saying is history is constantly rewritten for us. We don't have any power over our own history. <laughs> In colonialism, the imperial power of the, the colonizing force rewrites your history. So it's rewriting history as we go along. And the Supreme Court decision uh, last week was basically rewriting history in its own interest. Uh, for example, it says now that secession is not permitted. Scotland is not seceding from the Union. It's ending the Union <laughs> as it's obliged and, and, and has, has a capability to do. And Scott, it, it makes parallels with Quebec, which is part of a federation, not uh, a union of, uh, of kingdoms by treaty, by international treaty. So what this is basically is, is, is pre perpetuating this myth or this fraud, as, as Sarah says, that uh, the union is, is, it can hold Scotland in, in, in place, as it were. And that's the myth of the union. Uh, and basically the role of the colonizer in post-colonial theory is to make in, uh, independence seem impossible to the native. So they make independence, all routes to independence seem impossible, where it's really actually quite simple. But that's, that's what they do. And they stress also that only the values of the colonizer are sovereign. Uh, so what we see here is England's constitutional parliamentary sovereignty imposed on a subjugated Scotland. Uh, and, and, and also in respect of this imperial crown, England's crown, uh, over, uh, which is imposed on Scotland, which has its own crown, which the royals, for some reason, never want to go near, <laughs> never want to touch, never want to illustrate it going on their head, <laughs> as it were. So we, we have this uh, charade, this fraud. It's con history is constantly rewritten. And we're just in the throes of this colonial uh, uh, domain, as it were, this prison, as it were, uh, where, where we are being likened now to just a region of England or a region of Britain uh, that doesn't have any authority, sovereignty, power. It's completely alien to Scottish tradition, as Sarah says, Scottish constitutional tradition, Scottish history, but our history is being rewritten. We don't have control over this, not being an independent country. I think the, the other person I'd like to bring in now is Phil Boswell. Phil, for those of you who don't know, uh, is 
involved in both the construction and the oil industry, and he's a specialist in dispute uh, resolution. And if ever there was a dispute that needs resolved, this is the very one. So, Phil, what have you got to say about this? Thank you, Ian. I, I've looked at uh, what Sarah's prepared, and th this is a game changer, as far as I see. And, uh, and, and, and I'd rather stick to what Sarah has quoted and bring out some of the highlights for me. And I could maybe do it in two parts. I'll, I'll, I'll make a few points just now. But um, some of the quotations, and having reviewed this concise summary of the history, we can see that there's an awful lot to this. It's a very dry subject. It's a difficult subject to put over to people in concise terms. But if you take some of the highlights and, and the significance of some of, of the facts here, because this is, this, is, this is gold. This is absolute gold. You know, we, we, we're used to listening to people in talking shops talking about what we're going to do, how we're going to retain our independence. But this is the basis for an actual factual structure to be built, that how we can approach our independence and build something meaning, meaningful, the vehicles, etc. So if, if you look at it, there's this basically a 10 page document and, and, and some of the, the statements in it. Now, we talk about on page two penalties for any government violating the rules. You know, the Act establishes a Scottish constitutional relationship between the nation, the people for us, and the government, and their limits of governmental power. Is that, that, that's unique, quite unique. We, the people, limit the powers of the government. Have we, we've forgotten this. And, and that's, that's the message that needs to go over to people, uh, to our people, when we... Um, need to understand the consequences for breaching, breaching for the rules that we have set down in our, in our history, and it's there in our legislation, if we can bring it to the fore. Because the claim of right remains a condition of the union. Again, in, save, in, in, in page two on Sarah's paper, it is, and I quote, it is a thorn in the constitutional side of Westminster. We're, we, we need to use it. We need to use it as such. Uh, it, the, the Westminster government that operates on English constitutional principles and which studiously ignores, indeed buries or misrepresents the Scottish provisions which it is bound to uphold, as uh, King Charles recently reminded us. That this, that these kind of diamonds are the basis upon which we can build a winning game plan. And it's about time that the whole independence movement got behind um, what, what we're doing here, what SALV are doing, what SSRG are doing, what many of our think tanks are coming up with. And we, we, need, we need the SNP to get behind, behind this. We already have ALBA. We already have a number of, of individuals and significant individuals pulling in the right direction. But the unity that is so required to deliver our independence for our people um, must come from the political parties. They have to start listening to what is being said here. I move on to page three, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll do a few more just before we move on. There's a quote from Daniel Defoe that I love. And the quote is, the laws of government in Scotland continue as the government continues established in the claim of right. I mean, as to the limitations of government and obedience. Quote from Daniel Defoe. He was a unionist spy, and he has to concede this fact. That, th 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 these are the arguments we should be articulating and putting forward to, to guide our, our populist, our populist MPs, MSPs, and political parties to understand that the people have a better understanding of what we need, and this is the mechanism by which we could deliver it. Bottom of page three, nor could the creation of a new kingdom, a new state, and a new parliament transfer the territorial ownership of Scotland via the monarch to this new kingdom. Ownership of the land was and remains vested in the crown as representative of the community of realm, not in the monarch him or herself, just as the final legal authority in the land was 
and remains vested in the people. The people being the people of Scotland, the distinction between the rules in England and the rules in Scotland and the incompatibility of this alleged union of the crowns. It, there's just so much in here, Ian, that, that, that makes me think, if we can put this in a way that is understandable, that can be translated into, into policy, that, let's face it, politicians can understand, then we've got a fighting chance. Well, I think, Phil, I mean, if politicians want to get involved in it, yeah, nobody's saying they can. And, I mean, let's face it, our MPs next week wanted to start asking questions in Parliament about what basis, on what basis, they've been stealing our oil and gas, you know, for the last few decades because we can prove they had no legal right to it. And let's see what happens. But the most important thing, and whether this paper will be successful, is what the people, us, the people, do with it. If we refuse to accept what the Supreme Court's saying, if we attack on the basis you had no right to take this in the first place, you know, this is the great pain robbery, you know, you've been inflicting pain on the people of Scotland illegally, then you know, they're going to be in trouble. And so is any political party, by the way, that doesn't yep. get behind it because they're going to enrage their own members. So, I mean, we could get a real train going here that, in the right direction and stop the pain. And we should be doing that. Sarah, can I come back to you? Because yeah. I want you to emphasise one particular point. You mentioned it in your first time round. But I think a key element of this is that we can now prove that they couldn't possibly have transferred Scotland's territory and assets to Westminster simply yeah. because you can prove, we can prove, they never owned them in the first place. And even the most disinterested passerby knows that you can't sell or anything you don't actually own yourself. And that's why we can be so sure we're right. Yeah. Am I right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely right. In fact, it's not even, you know, it's not even that we have to make this argument because there was no way of hiding that fact. So it's actually there. When you, when you dig deep enough, you find that Scotland remains defined legally as a sovereign territorial nation. Yeah. And that is because yeah. it is acknowledged. It, they buried it over the, the, a, a clever wee thing they did um, when they talk about crown property. And that includes, by the way, you know, everything we're talking about includes the seabed, the continental shelf, the oil, the gas. Um, it's amazing. It actually goes so many miles up into the air and so many, <laughs> so many miles <laughs> into the earth. And uh, that remained in the holding of the community of the realm, the people of Scotland so that we, are, we, we have this status, sovereign territorial nation. It was, it was never legally transferred. There's no pretense, it's just covered up. So what they've done is they've talked about, uh, the government, UK government has talked about the right of the crown. Now that's correct. It's, you know, we, we look at this land in right of the crown, but in right of the crown in Scotland doesn't mean, didn't Same mean- as it doesn't. Yeah, it didn't mean Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth. It didn't mean His Majesty King Charles. It meant the community of the realm. Whereas in England, it was vested in the monarch and mm -hmm. right of the crown, which the state manages on behalf of the monarch. So we have two completely different situations covered by a single phrase that makes everybody think it's the same thing. But what they're actually doing is they are administering the resources of Scotland in right of the crown, us, mm -hmm. as a kind of, in a kind of, uh, you know, when you administer somebody else's assets, that's a trusteeship. You're a trustee. The parliament in Westminster has taken on the sovereignty of the monarch. It can do, you know, it, it can do with those assets as, as it likes because it's sovereign and blah, blah. But those assets never passed into its control. So it's operating as a kind of trustee for the people. But well, they're not in Scotland, are they? Because they're taking 100% of our but assets. you don't and under, only paying us back maybe eight percent. It's contract, you know. it's contract law. 
if yep. you're acting as a trustee and you defraud the beneficiaries, you yep. are you are in breach of the terms of the trust. You are you have committed fraud, and this is under modern, not just you know constitutional ancient Scots law. You have to make reparations. Yeah, and there's and international you know, courts. I'm correct in saying and there's international courts that make that out, possible. It turns out that sovereign peoples, not just nations. But sovereign peoples, as well as sovereign nations, have an inalienable right to the control, management, and benefit of their own resources. This is uh, to to deprive them of that is a crime in international law. Now we can go to a supreme court that has replaced the appellate court of Scotland, which has higher authority that has authority over the court of session, but is bound and has plates stated that it is bound to respect the English constitutional uh, principle of parliamentary sovereignty. Um, and we'll get exactly where we got with uh, the application to, 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 to run a wee opinion poll on whether people want independence. Um, you know, that's where we'll get, nowhere. And we're led to believe that that's it, that's the law, you're stuck. But as it turns out in international law, the ruling of a domestic court, even the highest court in the land, when it is the organ of a state accused of a, cr a crime against inter uh, an international um, an international crime, um, and Scotland as a sovereign territorial nation remains a separate nation, therefore this is an international crime, then the ruling of the highest court of the colonial administration is, is irrelevant. So what we have to do is we have to go to an independent, an international court, because the case is extremely clear. They knowingly, they knowingly defrauded Scotland, the beneficiaries of their trust, of yeah. everything that belonged to them. They have impoverished the people who owned those resources. And by law, what they should have done was set up a public body in Scotland to manage Scotland's resources. They could have taxed those resources, but we would have had the benefit of the, of the actual resource, the leases, the, we, we could have done as Norway did. We, we the could jobs. have ensured that our people... Yeah. We, we, it would we have would been have controlled had, in Scotland. We, we would yeah. have had all the jobs that are currently yeah. in the southeast of England. Yeah. You know? Alf, can I come to you? Because this can't be the first time that a colonial and you know government's acted in this way and robbed the assets of the host nation. Uh, can you maybe explain that? I mean, I'm thinking of India as a classic example because they robbed trillions from uh, India and told them they had a deficit every year, you know, which is a, it's where they got the idea to do that in Scotland. Yeah, well, colonialism, as we know, is, is uh, primarily economic uh, plunder. Uh, and, and this is what Sarah's explained has happened in the context of Scotland. Uh, and this is also what happened to every other former uh, British uh, colony that was that was plundered to, to that extent. So, and that's why uh, the UN introduced the decolonization processes and the self-determination legislation and the uh, rulings on that regard so that the former empire, imperial powers, that their, their power could be uh, diminished, vastly diminished, and, and actually removed. That was the, the, the deter that was the requirements, that was the intention of the UN uh, self-determination process, was to remove this scourge of colonialism across the world. What we have in, in, in Scotland is, is obscured by the fact that, uh, that it's, it's been going, partly been going on so long, and it's so entrenched, and cultural assimilation is so well developed. But uh, as Ireland and Wales both uh, uh, acknowledge uh, now, the, the colonialism aspect is also affects the internal colonies uh, as they're described within the UK and the Celtic periphery where the peoples and lands were exploited, are exploited uh, and, and the cultures uh, destroyed as well because that's part of the process of colonialism is, is cultural obliteration, which is something I've been studying quite closely in terms of culture and language. So that's how it's done. That's how the process is done. The mechanisms to get out of it, as, as, as Sarah has alluded to, international courts uh, are obviously an, an important part of, the, of, 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 of these kind of conflicts to try to resolve them peacefully. Uh, and, but also, I think, within the context of Scotland, we have 
we have a court, a Scots court, a Scottish court that should have and been examining these kind of uh, uh, misappropriations or, or theft of, of assets and also uh, violations to the treaty to claim a right. These violations can all be or should all be tested within a Scottish court as well. I mean, if they can test uh, uh, cases like the Rangers case and, and other uh, uh, you know, uh, problems, then it can easily test or should be able to test the, the violations to the treaty, I think, as well. So my hope was that uh, at some point a Scottish court might be able to address the treaty violations, bearing in mind also that Scottish courts only exist because of the treaty. Uh, the treaty is, is the only thing that protects Scots law, what we know is Scots law, uh, and, and that process as well as, 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 as the church and education as well. So I would have liked to see that done, but if that's not possible, we have to remember as well that, uh, that in colonies we tend to have a colonial justice system. That's why you have international courts. <laughs> so international courts to adjudicate on, on circumstances and events that a domestic court might be unwilling or unable to do properly. Uh, and that's another feature. The, the Scots, Scots uh, legal system has not really been able to address Scotland's constitutional reality uh, for a very long time, perhaps since that 1953 decision uh, yeah. that uh, uh, that demonstrated Scotland's different constitutional tradition uh, and laws. But maybe it's about time that was brought brought to bear. And I think that uh, we should use all mechanisms to to alleviate this this the scourge of colonialism, however you want to describe it, is still going on. It's legalized, it's theft of, of, of a country's resources, it's plunder of their resources, it's it's their obliteration of a people's culture, their nation. And, and, and as I've found in, in the studies of colonialism, you either get independence, liberation, or you you your 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 nation, your culture, your people, your identity, your language is all disappear and wither. And that's what's happening with Scotland at the moment. Can I go to you now, Phil? I mean, can, can, it's bad enough that this, these assets have been stolen, but it's not just that, but it's the total loss. What the total loss is what Scotland could have done with that wealth, with those resources, over all these years while we've been getting plundered. How different Scotland would look today. And, you know, the, there's a great opportunity being lost here, and it's vital that they bring it to an end now. So what do you think, Phil? Oh, 100%, Ian. Uh, where we are now is, and it's something both Sarah and Alf and yourself have touched on, uh, the Sovereign Wealth Fund. I, I worked for Statoil, and the philosophy is a completely different one when it comes down to oil and gas. We are using, um, what was with Statoil, Inconels. We're using stainless steel. So you're looking at life of fuel that is 30, 35 years. You're not looking at carbon steel 15-year 15, 15 lifestyles. You're not looking at the BP when they first got the 40s field. They just opened the valves. They didn't pressurise. They didn't use enhanced oil recovery. They didn't make every barrel count for the people. Now, what we could do now, and Sarah's pointed on it already, is we're not even halfway through the oil that we know about. Ian, so we, 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 sh we can easily create a sovereign wealth fund for the people of Scotland. And, and, and going back to the actual document itself, you, you're going to page four now, and there's a line that jumped out to me again. There's a quote in the third paragraph. Despite the many assertions of the British establishment to the contrary, and despite the imposition of English territorial and judicial sovereignty by fiat, Scotland remains by and remains a sovereign territorial nation. Now, the word fiat is critical here. And I think people would understand it if you consider, do consider financial or currency fiat. In 71, the dollar went fiat. That means it's not, by, not backed by anything of substance, as opposed to the original commodity, commodity currency, which was gold coin, or, or representative currency, which is backed by a gold standard. Money is essentially, essentially, and the, the pound sterling is basically a Ponzi scheme and has been, as with the US dollar since 1971. So whose game are we playing here? 
Why, why are we playing their game? We need to change the rules. And you, you go on, there's, a, there's another great uh, quote on, on page four. So while the full political and economic union, which is a con that these people have been playing all the way through between what were two previously independent countries is not in contest. So what we're saying is we don't argue the quote they put forward that full political and or economic union has happened. But we don't presume, as they would like to imply, that that is everything. There's much, much more to it. It's not, OK, we don't argue that's in contest, but the territory of Scotland has remained sovereign. That's critical. Because as defined by the reach of Scots law and the distinct legal character of the Scottish crown, there was no extinction of either nation. We, we continue to be a sovereign nation, and that's sovereign of the people. Yeah, I think, I, say, I, I think I'm right in saying that, that that line that we hear so often from Westminster, that Scotland and England ceased to exist and became one country, that was an aspiration of Queen Anne. It couldn't possibly be enacted because, you know, there was so many differences between Scotland and England. So, I mean... They quote to us an aspiration of a monarch from hundreds of years ago, and they're using that as a disguise to the reality that Scotland's still a sovereign nation and they had no rights to these uh, assets at all, you know, because Scotland was never, Scotland's territory was never ceded to anyone other than the people of Scotland. Correct, correct, Ian, and, and, and uh, Sarah's uh, paper speaks to this. If you go on to page five, it talks about, I mean, it, it, there's a, a quotation, a single United Kingdom of Great Britain only exists as a kind of aspirational ideal, a badge of identity. After all, states and nations may call themselves whatever they like. A true United Kingdom cannot exist as a legal entity, however, while the crowns of England and Scotland remain in place, ancient, separate, distinct and with very different constitutional implications. And if you look back to some of the old legislation, I'm talking about semi-ancient, the proper title is the United Kingdoms, not kingdom, the United Kingdoms, plural, because it's Scotland and England as the joint kingdoms. So yeah, absolutely buying on the money. And there's just, there's so much in this. I mean, you could go on all night. I'm going to let you have one more quotation. You have to pick your favourite because uh, I've got to give Sarah the final say. Oh, 100%. Well, well, as an oil man, I would go to page seven and quote the quotation um, point one and one, two, three, four, five, the sixth paragraph of the line. Uh, be it enacted, you know, his... The, by the king's most excellent majesty, that vesting the property of petroleum in his majesty. The property in petroleum existing in its natural condition in the strata, blah, 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 um, shall have the, the, his majesty shall have the exclusive right in searching and boring and getting such petroleum. Now, I'm absolutely okay if the backs Coburg Gothis or Windsors, as they so call themselves these days, uh, uh, in my opinion, uh, they're welcome to keep all the oil and gas that they personally extracted. For the rest of it, where it was licensed by others, we shall seek damages, civil damages or reparation. And, and there's talk of fire ice and all minerals. What people don't know, crystallised methane or fire ice, we know about it because it destabilises drill pipes. We map it all over the North Sea. We believe there's more fire ice or crystallised methane than there is oil and gas. It is now economically viable to farm this. The Chinese, Chinese are doing it on a large scale. The Japanese invented the technology. And it's not just oil and gas, it's minerals. And all the way out through the Rock Hall Basin and all across the North Sea, this, this is worth its weight in gold, quite literally. And you can't you can't grab it because well, because of the pressure and the temperature at the base of the sea, it's in mud quite often. If you pick a grab and you picked it up, as the pressure decreases, as the temperature increases, it turns back into a vapor or a gas, and you get bubbles of sea of methane, which obviously is, is no good. But we can now fire it. We can now 
develop this. So the financial implications of all the minerals that remain in the seabed go beyond the value of oil and gas, which we're not even halfway through. And the, the Norwegians have built a $1.3 trillion fund based on what they've done so far. Why? Because they look after their own, put our own house in order, and this is a vehicle we can use to do exactly that. Thanks very much, Phil. Sarah, can I move to you to round up and put the final word in all this? Well, the final word is, I suppose it's obvious. Um, you know, we've, we've gone round and round in circles after our politicians who have never looked at the constitutional relationship between Scotland and England. They've never looked at what happened at the treaty, what didn't happen at the treaty, and it's unlikely that they're going to get behind us very fast. But the way that this, the way this has to go is we will not, you, you don't go to the burglar and say, would you, would, do you mind admitting that you've been robbing me blind for the past 30, 40, in this case, 100 years or whatever. You go outside. And what we've been saying to people is, there is there are two organizations now we, we can we've sh the paper doesn't set out by any means the whole of international law on this matter but what is very clear is that a sovereign ter territorial nation has exclusive and permanent rights to its own natural resources and that's international law to which the uk government a member of the un security council is signed up so this is incredibly embarrassing. You know, if they could have got rid of all this old law, they would have done. If they could have written a codified constitution, so it was all taken care of, they would have done. But the attempt would have exposed the constitutional relationship between Scotland and England. So they couldn't risk that. So what we need to do is we need to go outside the colonial authority. We need to go to an international court. Two organizations can get standing with the UN. Um, that would allow them to bring uh, a, a petition to the International Court of Justice for an advisory ruling. One of those is a government. Now, the Scottish Parliament is not a government. It's the executive arm of Westminster. The other is a liberation movement. So my message to, 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 to people in Scotland that, that are kind of looking at this and, and, you know, and it's a lot to take on is you've been robbed. You've been defrauded. It's a criminal act. We can prove it. If you want to take back what belongs to you. If you want to help us restore Scotland's wealth, restore what belongs to Scotland, then get involved. Sign up at liberation.scot. The website is constantly under attack and people have a hell's own job getting in sometimes, but just keep going. Because when we reach a, a, good, a big enough number, a respectable number, we will apply for standing as a liberation movement with the UN and that's that's what this group is about steering committee for that um, it, it we will have people directly represented from the movement no politician is going to be able to do this and he, and it's exciting and it's scary it's us we can do this and we are the only movement that can do this no matter what people say. No petition is going to sit, do it. No march is going to do it. No protest is going to do it. And no devolved government is going to do it. But we can. And in the process, we can wake up the people of Scotland, all the undecideds, all the ones that don't know how they would feel about an independent Scotland. How are they going to feel when they know that we own all of this? That, that we can have a sovereign wealth fund tomorrow once we get a, a, once we get this straightened out, that we can look after our own, that Scotland can go from being a country where we are worrying about our, our vulnerable, our poor, our elderly, where ordinary people are, are hurting because they can't afford these ridiculous prices for the energy they own. They own it by law. Sorry, I get a bit excited about that. <laughs> we can do something about it but we have to stop waiting for our leaders to be smart enough, to be brave enough, to be bold enough. So, we, and, um, you know, so, so every Scot who thinks it would be a good idea to have back what we're entitled to 
and to be able to come out of this horrific crisis that has been created for us by a colonial administration just needs to get get online and sign up for liberation.scot and our politicians we really need to send them a very clear message we've been following you for decades decades and you've gone round and round in circles now we're going to have or oh, we'll have a plebiscite that will give us a mandate to demand another section 30. if you're sick of that you know then maybe it's time you got behind the people and there's a warning here no country has ever achieved self-determination through its politicians and the political machinery put in by the colonial establishment none the only way any country has achieved self-determination has been through a liberation movement if you if you don't believe me go and look at your history recent and you know right back to the to the beginning of the last century no country ever got self-determination by saying please to the colonial colonial administration it was always a liberation movement and almost always as we know from the the, the estonia story the politicians have not caught up with the people ireland three it took the politicians three years from the dublin proclamation to get behind the people and in those countries where there has been a liberation movement, that movement has turned into the political party that swept the board. Yeah. That doesn't have to happen. But if you're not paying attention to world history and you're not looking at the pattern and you're pretending that you can stay in charge and, and have people going round and round in circles indefinitely while you pick up your fat salaries, then you're in for a very rude awakening. Because when people in Scotland understand what has really been done to them, what they're entitled to, and that we can go right around Westminster for justice and to take back what belongs to us, who do you think they're going to back? And who do you think they're going to want to follow? Them, their own movement or the people that have read them round, led them around in circles? What's going to happen? If they don't wake up fast, they're going to find that the liberation movement, when it really explodes, is going to turn into the party that sweeps them out. Yeah. I don't want to see that happen, but that is what has happened historically. And it's about time our politicians woke up and, and, and smelled the coffee. Thanks very much for that, Sarah. I don't think we could have had a better ending to any programme at a time when the whole of Scotland's looking for hope and looking for direction. You've got it today here in Bucketfuls from Sarah and the rest of my guests. So thank you for watching. I hope you're enthused. And you, are the really important people because it is the people, it is you, and I mean you personally. Have you signed up to liberation? Good. If you have, catch up if you've not. Tell your friends, get everyone involved. We'll have sons and daughters. We can have kids if they want. It's going to be their country one day. We've got to get everyone possible to sign up to this and let's get Scotland moving instead of, as Sarah says, Get round in circles to nowhere. So thanks for watching. I hope you've enjoyed the programme.